It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, John Carlson. John is the Grassland Conservation Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Mountain Prairie Region based in Billings. And before that, he was the branch chief for resources and also the sage grouse lead for the Montana Dakotas Bureau of Land Management. Other relevant positions he has had um, include a stint as a wildlife biologist with the BLM in Glasgow, Montana. And he was also the zoology program manager for the Montana Natural Heritage Program. Some irrelevant jobs, according to him, include bread store worker, tour guide, fence builder, and snow shoveler at an Antarctic base. And maybe not so irrelevant, I'd say. But uh, John got his BA in zoology from the University of Montana and his MS in zoology and physiology from the University of Wyoming. He was born and raised in Northeastern Montana and has had a strong interest in wildlife and birds for as long as he can remember. His life in Billings intersects with two teenage boys, his long suffering wife, Laura, and two flat coated retrievers. And with that, welcome, John. I'll go ahead That's and Beth. stop sharing my screen. Okay. Go ahead and share yours. You can take it away. Okay, how's that? Great. Got it, okay. And Good. you're coming in loud and clear. Good. Well. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad you all were could join us, and I, I really appreciate this Zoom platform to be able to uh, do this remotely and have you join remotely as well. And I, um, and as Beth mentioned, I got my undergraduate at the University of Montana, right alongside Beth Madden, and that's how long I've known Beth. And our, our careers have intersected here and there, and particularly over this grassland work. And uh, tonight I want to talk to you a bit about um, why grasslands and, and I was struggling for kind of a while to try and figure out how to, to frame this talk and um, I'm involved in a leadership training right now and I recently had a, uh, a video assignment and the, the video assignment was watching this uh, TED talk and the guy was talking about efforts that failed and efforts that succeeded. And one of the things that he mentioned was the efforts that seemed to have a, a consistent success rate often dealt with the why they were doing things rather than the how and what. And I, I thought about that for a while and um, thought that might be a good kind of place to start exploring grasslands for you all tonight. Um, I realize I'm talking to the Montana Native Plant Society, I am not a botanist. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of bird pictures, uh, but they're all be associated with the grasslands. Um, I, I, I put a few other photos in here as well. So I may need some help with some of the plant ID, but um, what I really wanna talk about, and this is the lens I tend to, I grew up looking at grasslands was through the birds. Um, grassland birds are, are pretty near and dear to my heart from uh, work that I've done throughout my career. So I'm just going to dive into this now, if I can get my slides to advance again. There we go. So what I'm going to do is kind of walk through grassland ecology first. It's trying to set the stage for what, what's going on. and, and I, mostly our grasslands as a biome inhabit this middle portion of the United States, these central grasslands. Grasslands are uh, also found throughout the rest of the continent, but usually they're inclusions um, in other major biome types. So mostly what I'm going to focus my talk tonight on is this central grassland biome, which the dominant um, feature of the landscape is the grasslands. And so the, the factors that what, what, that caused us to have these central grasslands in the middle of the continent are driven by kind of three big drivers. 
And the first one is moisture. Um, with moisture coming across generally from the west to east, Rocky Mountains draining a lot of that moisture out of those formations as they cross the mountains, this central part of the United States is generally drier. Um, as you move further east, they start getting wetter again. And that also drives a little bit of the structure of the grasslands with more drier short grass being close up against the Rocky Mountains. And then as you get more moisture resulting in better grass growth, um, you wind up with tall grass prairies on that eastern fringe. Um, let's see here. Soils are also a factor in producing grasslands. You can see this starts outlining that major, and the, the inclusion I'm seeing here in this green, the dominant soil of our grassland systems also is pretty predominant in the sagebrush system. So, which is another dry type of, of vegetation in the central part of the west. But most of what I'm talking about here is these soils, um, this green, I can't even remember what that, mall soils, I guess. Um, I'm also not a soil scientist, so bear with me. I know enough about the ecology of grasslands to recognize that soils are a big driver, but I, I'm not a soil scientist. What I do know is disturbance on grasslands. Um, the big one is the herbivory. And, and this combination of moisture soils and disturbance limits what can grow to pretty much grasses. And grasses, I probably, this is redundant for a lot of you. The, the, the beauty of grasses in the system is that most of their um, biomass is underground in their root systems. The above ground part of the plant is really well adapted to being removed through, from these disturbances. Historically, uh, the, the traditional big grazer of the central grasslands in the United States or in North America was bison. Um, these large ungulates with you know, pronghorn and elk mixed in there um, in the most recent history of the grasslands, it's these large ungulates. One of the forgotten drivers in herbivory in the Great Plains is the Rocky Mountain locust. And this is something I came across. Jeff Lockwood is, was an entomologist at the University of Wyoming, wrote a book about the Rocky Mountain locust. Um, extinct now. This, this was Laura Ingalls Wilder in her book. I don't remember reading those when you were little. I do. Uh, talked about these swarms of locusts coming across the grasslands in Minnesota. And there are reports of millions of insects calculated by the size of the clouds of these, these locusts coming out across the Great Plains. This was a very dramatic um, herbivory driver in the Great Plains, uh, and now extinct, which Jeff Lockwood actually got into the philosophy of, of pest control because of this work on, on, his grass, on the grasshoppers. Most of the, the research work was in looking at how to get rid of them. And he was more interested in the ecology and the fact that we had this Rocky Mountain locust that's extinct. And one of the things I want you to realize as we're talking about that, and you see the map behind, is that the scales at which these disturbances happened were huge. Um, raising from the large mammals, these herds of bison moving up and down this landscape, migrating north and south with the seasons, these eruptions of Rocky Mountain locusts, and then this next one, fire. Um, fire was, a, a, and still should be, I would argue, a main driver in a lot of the ecology of our, our grasslands. Combined with herbivory, these, the fire is the main means of keeping woody vegetation um, from encroaching on our prairies and our grasslands. And I'm gonna use prairie and grasslands interchangeably throughout this talk. Um, I have to, little side note, I do like prairie a little bit better um, because I think grasslands kind of gives a short shrift to the, the forb component of our grasslands, which is also so important particularly when we start talking about pollinators and seed production for birds. And um, just as that, I think prairie encapsulates that 
idea a little bit better than grasslands does, but I'm so used to using grasslands that I, I wind up falling back to that. But so fire, again, uh, often human caused, historically human caused, huge fires across these grasslands. They, these, op, these fires operated at very large scales, much like the locusts and the grazers. And these all combine to produce a patchwork with moisture and with soils of a completely uh, dynamic system that had short grass and tall grass and residual grass that didn't get grazed last year and new grass that had just growing after a fire, after a, um, a grazing disturbance. And this, this concept of pyric herbivory of the fire and the, the grazers kind of interacting in their interplay across the landscape made a very dynamic. Grasslands in general don't look that dynamic to most people, but once you start understanding them, that that heterogeneity in the grasslands, particularly ones that are have that fire component and the grazing component still attached to them, is absolutely phenomenal. And the, the bird life responds to that accordingly. So this is what the historical extent of the grassland biome was, was imagined to be, uh, extending down here into southern Mexico, coastal plains of Texas, um, all the way into Illinois, um, across the northern part of Missouri, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, all the way up here to the Rocky Mountains on the west and then down into Southern Arizona with different types. You can see they've, they've classified these different types. And again, it's predominantly uh, built off of that soil moisture combination into what you would wind up and the soils as well. You can see sandy plains versus um, other areas, I guess. This Northern tall grass prairie um, here and then up into Canada. Um, where my I grew up here in the northwestern Great Plains mixed grass prairie, which is a mouthful. So this is what I know best. But um, just as I've expanded my work now, I'm I'm as part of my job working from Mexico up into Canada with a tri-national uh, effort to try and conserve the grasslands that we have left. And this is pretty much what's left. Um, you can see most of this eastern part, I would argue, still growing grass. It's just um, a very exotic grass called corn and wheat um, and a lot of soybeans. And, and for a long time, and even probably the production of this map, was driven by where grasslands had been turned into cultivated fields to grow domestic grass of some sort or another. Uh, you can see here in eastern Montana, this part of Wyoming, southwestern South Dakota, North Dakota, the sand hills here, probably the last largest intact grasslands in the world. Um, and then stretching down some of this tall grass here in western Kansas, the Flint Hills. The reasons these are still here is because they are a culture uh, in that landscape that's still centered around growing grass. And, and that's primarily through beef production. Um, and so that, that culture of turning grass into beef is essentially what's kept these predominantly private lands intact grasslands. And I have to acknowledge that this is a primarily private landscape, unlike the sagebrush side of things where uh, there's a high proportion of public lands. Doing conservation in a, a predominantly public land landscape is very different than trying to do it in a public land landscape. And that's part of the navigation of uh, conservation efforts that I've been involved with. So, um, what are the threats? I already talked about the conversion to grass, uh, to um, plowed fields. Uh, that is probably the main driver uh, that we've seen. This is a map from what's called the plow print and it's World Wildlife Fund um, product that tracks the amount of uh, that are being turned into 
plowed fields in any given year. And then most recently, conifers and, and woody transition of grasslands into conifers with some of the remote sensing products that we now have and the ability to model this and, and pick up the signature of trees different from grass. Um, this has become a very um, kind of insidious threat to grasslands because it's this native vegetation. These uh, Eastern red cedars are expanding from the South, junipers expanding in the Northern Great Plains. And you can see here this woodland transition um, diagram here. Um, as the trees, and the, the primary driver of getting new trees is where you have trees already. So it's independent of soils and moisture. It's just if you've got trees in the vicinity, you're going to wind up more trees expanding out across. And you can see within 18 years, the expansion of that woody encroachment into these predominantly grassland states has been very severe. And we're actually now able to track how much grass production is lost to any particular <laughs> landscape through the encroachment of trees, which is helping us get the, the community buy-in in this predominantly private landscape to actually start bringing fire back into the, 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 the biome, because that is the most effective tool to bring back our grasslands and stem the invasion of these woody um, plants into the, the prairie. The other big one, particularly in the northern part of the range, which is a little bit different, more difficult for us to track is uh, Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome. It's a little more insidious. It still looks like grass from our satellite imagery, but it does change the composition of our prairies quite considerably. And it's severely impacted uh, monocultures of Kentucky bluegrass. We completely lose that forb component and they can still function somewhat for bird habitat because birds are keying more in on the structure rather than the species, but pollinators in particular, and I would imagine a number of other insects that rely on forbs um, are the ones that lose out in these, these converted uh, bluegrass mixed, the, the prairies that's been converted to bluegrass or smooth brome. And then of course, climate change is operating in the background. I just got done with a, a day and a half training on climate change uh, planning and what we might do in some of our grassland systems, what the expectation might be for our grasslands and how we might be able to try and at least keep our options open in a, in a changing world for managers in the future. But essentially um, the projections are drier and maybe flashier. Um, precipitation events, which would shift a lot of these more mixed grass areas into more dry areas and wind up with a potentially very different grassland. And then, but you also have that component of the, the woody threats coming in there and that dynamic. It's, it's really hard to predict, but we can be assured that things will probably change in the grasslands. And so this, this idea of keeping large blocks of intact grasslands is probably our best bet to ensure that we have the the latitude to handle any changes within the grassland systems due to climate change. So when we combine all of that, and this is part of an organization I'm going to talk about a little bit later, the Central Grasslands Roadmap. And this is the landscape that we're, we're focusing on. I, it's, focus seems a little bit odd when you're talking about most mid part of a continent, but this is the grassland biome. Um, and you can see here those core grasslands when we combine the cultivation and the altered grasslands from conifer encroachment, um, where we're sitting here. And, and primarily it's the sand hills, this western or eastern Wyoming, western South Dakota, up through Montana here. And then these are actually, this area up here in Alberta is primarily driven by a large military base, Suffield. So, where we're looking is trying to invite people to work in these landscapes where we can stem the tide of this loss from cultivation and encroaching trees. So now, what does that mean from, from the biological side? I've talked about loss of grass, and this is probably the best data that we have as far as the impact on species associated with grasslands. Uh, this was from the State of the Birds uh, 
geez, three years, four years ago now. Um, and you can see here, the loss of grassland is almost exactly mirrored by the loss, percentage loss of grassland birds. There are most decreased a guild of birds and the, um, just the impact and the loss is astronomical. 720 million grassland birds since 1970. I, I've seen the changes in my lifetime in the places I grew up. Um, and, and I grew up in probably one of the best grassland areas for grassland birds left in the world in northeastern Montana and Valley County. So I've kind of walked through the very technical why part of this, this talk. I've given you kind of the background. What I want to do now is talk about more of the personal why and the aesthetic why which in some cases I think is almost more powerful in telling the story about grasslands and the importance of grasslands to me and hopefully to all of us. And so this is just gonna be from here on out until the end. I've got a little bit of, of a hope slides at the end after that really depressing first part of this. Um, I'm just gonna show some photos that I've taken over the years, things that matter to me. Um, this, is, this happens to be my favorite grassland flower, Liatris. And uh, it's actually the name of the kennel where my flat-coated retrievers came from. She's also a botanist and a prairie ecologist. Uh, just, I, I love these flowers, blazing stars. Um, this is that splash of color late in the summer. These are late blooming summer plants when the rest of the prairie is pretty much starting to dry out and you get these columns of, of bright purple popping out of the prairie. And it's always kind of, the, to me, that really nice uh, sign of life in a prairie that's pretty well desiccated by the end of July. Um, just, yeah. Um, and this is, I mentioned where I grew up. This is, this is Bitter Creek. This is in North Valley County. This is probably not the best part of the grasslands of Bitter Creek, but it's certainly the most scenic as it drops off of this big plateau down into the bottom of Bitter Creek. And those two guys in that picture are now my teenage boys. This is when I actually lived in Glasgow. It's my wife, Laura, there. And this is family. And this is not only my family and the connection to grasslands, but um, uh, a number of families. I mentioned that culture of raising cows converting grass into beef and how that particular culture in particular it gets a lot of bad rap and some of it I would say is has been earned in in some poor management practices but th that culture is our most effective um uh partner in grassland conservation and because they care about the grass too and, and as we can learn together about finding what works for all of us to maintain these grasslands more powerful we are, we are going to be in doing that. So this is this is the why for me is, is family, not my family, but uh, the families that make their living off of these pretty special places. And then I, I, I warned you I was gonna dive into the birds. This is, this is my probably favorite uh, grassland bird, the, Thick-billed longspur, formerly McCown's longspur. The Lewis and Clark first encountered this bird, although they didn't collect any and name it, at the mouth of the Marias River on their trip north, so right in the middle of Montana. I suspect they were probably a little more concerned about which river they were going to take at that point to collect any birds, but um, the description of the official description of this bird came much later in northern Texas on their wintering ground by John McCown, who was a Confederate soldier, hence the name change. Um, these guys are a short grass specialist, and it's kind of my poster child for grassland conservation, my personal poster child. These guys used to range all the way to Minnesota. Um, and you might recall that was tall grass prairie. And I mentioned these guys are short grass specialists. They need bare ground, they need short grass. How can a short grass bird be found in Minnesota historically? Well, it comes back to that disturbance and the large scales of those disturbances. 
that grazing and fire, even in a tall grass prairie, um, provided the habitats, this dynamic grassland provided the habitats for these short grass prairie specialists, probably not too far away from Henslow sparrows, which are a very tall grass specialist. So the, the change in scale in the disturbances, the, the amount of disturbance on the landscape and the loss of grassland have all conspired to push these birds west. Um, the western edge of their breeding range is now maybe barely into North Dakota. The heart of it is in Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Wyoming, and Colorado, hard up against the Rocky Mountains. Um, they just they, These guys get up in the sky, and you can see in the picture on the left, they parachute down to the ground, singing the whole time. And... You get out in the middle of a prairie and then where there's enough short grass in the spring and June and have these guys raining down around you, burbling out this song is, is pretty special. This is another one of my whys. And then um, you get into the, these fascinating, these shorebirds thing. This is something you'd expect to see on the beach in La Jolla not in the middle of our grasslands um, in middle of Montana, but they, this is where they come to breed. So we've got this very different habitat from their wintering grounds on the shore to these grasslands in the summer. And this is always a kind of a big harbinger spring for me is finding the first long-billed curlews showing up in the grassland and hearing this call and we, these, I think these birds probably fed a few settlers early on. Um, I think people were a lot like most of the wildlife in the Great Plains, that they moved around a lot to um, deal with the changing conditions during the winter and moved to places that were more amenable to, to surviving um, rather than staying out in the uplands. Um, many of our birds completely leave in the winter, and the grasslands are a very different place in the winter. Um, but as settlers arrived and stayed there year round, um, these birds coming back in the spring all fat and uh, from their wintering grounds and, and starting to breed were probably a pretty good delicacy as they, they showed up. But again, another really iconic grassland bird for me. Pronghorn, uh, strange North American animal left over from the Pleistocene. Uh, very fast runners because they used to have to chase or have to outrun North American cheetahs, which we no longer have, but they haven't lost their speed at all. To me, this is the iconic grassland ungulate. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate to be involved in a number of studies looking at their migration routes in Northern Montana coming out of Canada. And I have a, a story about a, a pronghorn I watched to get a radio collar on. Uh, it was the middle of winter outside of Glasgow. A helicopter crew from New Zealand came in and they were net gunning antelope. And I happened to be out taking photos of the net gunning operations. Watch this particular animal get captured. And I figured out which number it was from Andrew Jakes, who was the researcher on this project, and um, asked him for updates on 166 throughout the year. And that was uh, the year we had, 2011, that we had the horrible deep snow and across Montana. 166 normally spent her winters north of Highway 2 in Valley County. That winter she took off and headed south. Uh, about Christmas time she was on the north side of Fort Peck Reservoir. I was out looking for sage grouse in the middle of winter to take photos of. After we got 166 tracks back we were, I probably saw her that day. There were antelope moving south through that landscape and um, our tracks pretty much intersected on the same day somewhere in South Valley County. Unfortunately, 166 wound up crossing Fort Peck Reservoir and got hit on the highway between Jordan and uh, Grass Range. And I, I was fortunate enough to get a, a receiver and actually found 166. I was, I was the one who picked up her collar. And that that travels that that animal went on gave me a glimpse into the dynamics of the historical part of the system 
and that scale that these animals worked in that we are slowly chopping up piece by piece. And the fact that a lot of those antelope that went south of the reservoir that winter never made it home because by the time they turned around to go north, the ice had gone out of Fort Peck Lake and they could not get across the reservoir swimming. So there were herds of am displaced antelope that normally would have spent their summer in Canada um, parked on the south side of Fort Peck Lake looking, trying to get north. So that's another why for me is because I want to see these things continue again for my family, for everybody's families, to be able to see these huge migrations of pronghorn continue into the future. It seems kind of odd to have a cow picture and a grassland talk from a wildlife biologist. But like I mentioned earlier, um, the ranchers that I get to work with that make a living turning grass into beef are the reason, with a lot, I shouldn't say the only reason, because there's certainly been a number of professional uh, conservationists, be it government, NGO, state governments that have all worked our joint ventures. So we've got migratory bird joint ventures that are partner driven organizations that find ways to make conservation happen on the ground. But the neat part is that um, working with ranchers and, and this idea that we're trying to keep grasslands for all of us. Um, when we start, well, one of the biggest successes I've seen is when we start talking about grasslands in the language we each understand. Uh, when I was talking about earlier about the um, conversion to woodlands, the language we figured out to talk about was pounds of grass being lost to trees. That's something producers understand when they're losing income because of trees and they're grow, trying to grow grass, they understand that. And so we had that common language about loss of grasslands just presented a different way that's really made things start to happen in these landscapes. So this is another why for me. It's, it's the people that make their li livelihood off of these predominantly private lands and if they're not growing cows, the next thing they're going to do is probably sell it and turn it into cultivated fields to grow something else. Um, the prairie wildflowers are, are pretty spectacular. Again, this is another, not quite up there with Lyatris with me, but these um, gumbo lilies are, are a, a spring sign of home for me, particularly in the drier soils of South Valley County. Um, let's start going through this a little bit faster so I don't run out of time at the end here. Uh, lark buntings. These are, are eruptive birds in our grasslands. And this is another one that ties this whole continent together because these birds breed probably from New Mexico all the way up into Canada, but not always in those same places. And when we have big eruptions of lark buntings in Montana, it's usually because conditions aren't very well in the southern part of their range and vice versa. So these birds are very well adapted to moving across this huge landscape to find the, where the conditions are just right. And you can imagine historically with those large scale disturbances I talked about of fire and grazing that in any given year, those combinations would be very different across big parts of the landscape. So these birds have evolved to, to move long distances between years, even within years, to find the right breeding conditions. And these guys are probably the, the, the biggest example of this because they tend to flock up where our other grassland birds in the, in the summertime are pretty uh, much loners. Seeing huge flocks of these black and white birds is um, pretty obvious when you have a lot more lark buntings in the landscape, say, than maybe a, a Sprague's pipit. Another one is the mountain plover. Um, again, a very short grass specialist, um, very tightly associated with prairie dogs in most areas, but in some areas, they're just tied to soil types. Um, and they don't rely on that dynamic, they know the soil is going to provide the conditions that they want uh, no matter what. So this is a, a mountain plover, specially managed area in South Valley County on BLM lands. 
that is one of those areas that is consistently has mountain plovers, no matter what the dynamics of the grasslands are going on around them, in particular prairie dog colonies. So in, say, South Phillips County in Montana, these guys are really much more tied to the, the ups and downs of prairie dog populations and the prairie dogs providing that bare ground that they, they desire for their breeding. This guy I don't know much about. Um, in fact, I'm drawing a blank on the uh, tiger beetle. Um, I, a good friend of mine does a lot of tiger beetle work and he told me what this one was. But this is what I threw this in here is the dynamics of this other component of grasslands that often people don't think about, and that's the insect component. Um, pollinators, which I'll touch on a little bit later, are, are pretty obvious, but there's a whole host of other um, insects that are very big drivers. And not, I didn't have a picture of a dung beetle, but that's another one that's become quite important lately as we start talking about um, the dynamics of recycling within a prairie and the breakdown of uh, fecal matter from these grazers and how important dung beetles are to doing that. And one of the things we found is that a lot of the um, dewormers that are used in modern livestock operations, um, particularly if they're done out on the open range, are deadly insecticides that uh, when a dung beetle goes to eat the cow patties, they wind up getting killed. So we're looking at ways to try and minimize the use of uh, chemicals like ivermectin in a lot of these places to ensure that we have that good nutrient cycling for our prairie soils. Um, I had to throw a picture of Montana state bird in here. Uh, this is the, the, the story with Western meadowlarks is pretty interesting too, because we always think of these as being pretty ubiquitous common birds. But what we found is, is even, even our um, Western meadowlarks have declined significantly throughout the continent. And so it's just, again, tying back these things that we, we've always kind of taken for granted, our state bird that's all over the place, that when you look across the entirety of the United States, that these, these birds are also experiencing some rather severe declines. And oftentimes we don't notice that because in like growing up, I didn't know the extent of the, the loss of grasslands because I was living in some one of the best grasslands in the world. And it wasn't until I got older and started traveling around thinking, probably like a lot of people, that that was very typical of our Great Plains. And I found out very quickly that, that Valley County is not very typical at all in a lot of ways, um, but particularly with the extent of grasslands still left in that county compared to a lot of other places in the world. It, it is really special. So this why is for me is the the recognizing of common birds and, and, and realizing that they may not be as common as we think they are. And then again, I'll come back to the larkspur here and the pincushion cactus. Again, those splashes of color in the springtime on the prairie. I just, June, late May on the prairie are just pretty special for me. And I always try to make a, a trip back to Valley County to, um, experience that special time of year when the prairies come alive and the flowers start blooming and the birds are singing. Um, that generally dull beige color turns into a riot of different colors, yellows and purples and the green grass. And like I said the birds, the, the auditory component of that is, is pretty special as well. And you get some pretty amazing sunsets on top of it. Um, the bobolink, it's probably the same picture that's sitting behind me, I guess, in this talk. Uh, this is a little bit taller grass specialist. These guys winter in South America and they can become big pests because they form big flocks and they raid fields and there's just huge flocks of these guys in the wintering grounds. And the why I put in here is that the recognition that a lot of the species that we deal with in North America only spend a portion of their lives in our part of the grasslands. And our grasslands are connected, not only in the, 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 the extent of the biome in North America, but a lot of our grassland birds wind up in the pampas of South America and Argentina and Brazil. And um, 
spend their winter there, the, the, the greater proportion of their life cycle, actually, Swainson's hawks are the other ones that are um, that, that connector species between the grasslands in North and South America, where they go down to South America and specialize in eating grasshoppers during the winter. Um, these guys, not quite as far, but again, that connectedness of our grasslands across this part of the world. Um, chestnut collared longspur, to me, this is one of the most uh, colorful of the grassland birds. Most of the time, they're pretty dull looking. Um, beautiful voice, but not the, not the most spectacular birds to look at. But these guys really dress it up quite a bit for a grassland bird with that nice rufous nape and then that black and, and creamy yellow coloring, and just spectacular. Um, and again, these guys will get up in the air and start singing in the well as well. They much like the thick-billed longspur, but they a uh, little bit closer to the ground and not so much of that parachuting activity that I described for the thick-billed longspurs. And these guys have done actually fairly well under what I would say would be a, a misguided management direction where a lot of our range management for a long time was driven towards not too much and not too little. So it's the Goldilocks of finding the right, just leave enough grass for next year, but manage towards the middle. And that is completely contrary to the dynamics I described to you earlier that are historical um, conditions for our grasslands of having this wide heterogeneity of grassland structure and composition. These guys kind of struck gold because they are the midgrass specialist. And so out of all the grassland birds that have seen significant declines, mostly because of that loss, these guys haven't been as much impacted from the management of our existing grasslands because we're managing it very well for them. Um, and then grouse. This is, this is kind of tying back into the sportsman side of things, right? Um, this is a game bird managed by the states, found throughout the central grasslands. This is the, 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 one of the preeminent prairie grouse. And they do these beautiful um, dynamic wind-up toy sort of displays on, on Lex, are their uh, traditional breeding grounds in the springtime. And this is a, a fond memory for me of, of going out in the grasslands with my dad to watch the grouse early in the morning, in the spring mornings, uh, bull sharp tail and sage grouse. Uh, so this is a why for me is, is that, that tie with my dad, which really got me into this, this whole bird watching that led into a career and the reason I'm talking to you tonight. So this is very personal for me in that it's, um, I get back to why I started doing this. And this is one of the birds that, that evokes that memory for me. I did say I was gonna get back to some other pollinators. Um, this one, the monarch butterfly, um, probably not as common in the Great Plains, at least not in Montana as some other portions, but one of those really big dynamic, kind of a, almost a megafauna of insects that has driven a lot of attention to pollinator issues. Um, this happened to be just outside of Fort Peck on a, a, a Fish and Wildlife Service former crop field that had been planted back to a lot of pollinators, including these Rocky Mountain bee plants. And um, it was really nice to see the agency I worked for restoring some of the grasslands that, that formerly had been used to crop share for food for wildlife, now being converted back into a much more um, dynamic and natural food source, particularly for these pollinators. And I can't, can't leave these guys out. Um, this is actually a, a bison cow and a calf from a, a fairly small herd that exists in Fort Peck, Montana. And this is tying it back kind of the, the broad scale, the United States national animal that really drove a lot of the dynamics of these grassland systems, drove a lot of the dynamics of, of our Native Americans. Um, and the indigenous people of this continent relied on this animal 
I, I, I grew up with bison. It's just a small herd right there at Fort Peck. And um, so this is another connection to me. The why for me um, is knowing that this animal and growing up with it and that the, the cultural history associated with bison is just profound. When I think about the house I grew up in in Fort Peck on the edge of the Missouri River and rewind in my mind in time to what that landscape would have looked like and the immense herds of bison that Lewis and Clark recorded coming through that area and that sustained an entire indigenous culture. Um, this is another really profound animal for me in, in grassland conservation. And then kind of tying back to another uh, cultural tie to the native people. I showed you the, the um, sharp-tailed grouse earlier. This is a greater prairie chicken and a very similar dance um, in the springtime, this happens to be on a lek in the Fort Pier National Grasslands managed by the Forest Service in South Dakota. And I was fortunate enough to go down there and observe these guys on their lek a few years ago. And um, just spectacular, again, beautiful mornings on the prairie, uh, watching these guys go through their mating dances was pretty spectacular. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the cultural ties of grasslands to the people um, native to this continent. Uh, this, this was a gentleman doing a Native American dance called the chicken dance. And this was a, a special treat. The organizers of a, a grouse conference that I went to a few years ago in Lander, Wyoming, organized for us on one of our field trips. We had pulled up to this overlook. Um, we really didn't know what we were pulling off. Everybody got out of the bus. This gentleman emerged over the edge of the hill with a drummer and a singer. And he did this chicken dance for us out in the middle of the prairie. And it was pretty, this was a why moment for me um, that, that touch to that ancient culture uh, intimately linked to the grasslands that I value so much as well. And this, this still uh, is one of my favorite memories of any conference I have ever gone to was the surprise they pulled on us this day. And then the prairie smoke, um, again, this brings me right back to the Valley County and uh, laying out in the prairie early in the spring. Um, and I think these are almost as spectacular in flower as they are when they go to seed and form these, where the name comes from, that smoky part as those sneed, seeds expand and, and blow away in the wind. Yeah. And this, this is another one. I'm getting close here, aren't I, Beth? Um, this was happened to be that same winter. I was driving back and forth of that winter between Billings and Glasgow. So I got to see again these movements of pronghorn across the landscape and the the challenges they faced and this is part of the conundrum in grasslands is that i mentioned earlier about the the importance of keeping a, a grazing culture in these grasslands oftentimes that management has fences associated with it so we can make sure that we're managing and grazing appropriately by moving cattle primarily across the landscape into different pastures. But that what that does is it breaks up the landscape for particularly for animals that want to move through it. And fences are a big deal for pronghorn as they try to move back and forth. And so a lot of effort has gone in of that study I mentioned I was part of. A lot of the results from that have uh, any of you driven Highway 2 relatively recently, there are signs along the highway warning that there's pronghorn migrating and a lot of work at replacing fences with wildlife friendly fences to ensure that these animals can move back and forth across the landscape, identifying fences that are particular barriers to these animals and um, and helping fix those so that they can move more readily across the landscape. And uh, this is another one of my, the, the fabulous four of grassland birds in my mind. This is the Baird Sparrow. And the reason 
this one is in here because this reminds me that of the dynamics of the grasslands. Um, this is a bit taller grass specialist and you can see these a little more residual cover. And again, these are birds that move readily around the landscape trying to find those spots where those conditions are just right for them, the taller grass. And they've got this beautiful little tinkling song that um, it's getting harder for me to hear, but it's still, again, another sign that, that this, this suite of grassland birds have come home again to the prairie that I, uh, I value so much. And then this is a regal fritillary. This is another grassland specialist. It's actually petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. This gets back to the, the comment I made earlier about the form component of our grasslands and how I think prairie is probably a more apt descriptor. It allows me to imagine the full composition of forbs and grasses that we're concerned about to ensure that we keep the, the, the components of life, all of the components of life associated with our grasslands. And don't forget about these, these other pieces that aren't as ready, readily observable. All this guy is pretty spectacular butterfly, I have to admit. Um, and Beth, I think I'm gonna, this is one of your favorites. I, I think this may be my last slide. This is the Sprague's Pippet. And uh, again, these guys were one of the most common birds with some of the early naturalists coming across the Canadian US border, North Dakota, Montana. They were everywhere, but they never saw them. Um, this bird gets way up in the high in the sky and floats and sings for hours. And unless you spend the time to try and find them, they are so very difficult to find. But it's almost ethereal. The sound is coming from somewhere above you. And I, I can't describe it, but it just, it, again, it's another one of those why things for me, because this, this magical place in the springtime with these, these birds you can't even see producing this sound that just permeates the landscape. When it's not blowing 90 miles an hour and much easier to hear. Oh, I, I had to throw the magpie in here. Um, I, just, this, this is probably my all time favorite Montana bird, I would have to say because they stick here year round. Um, and Bill Yellowtail, when he um, introduced the bill in the Montana legislature to have Western Meadowlark replaced with the black-billed magpie, I think that's one of his arguments was that um, we'd much rather have a, a Montana state bird that stays here all year round rather than leaves when the going get tough. And these guys were typical prairie birds um, I was just reading an account from a naturalist in, in uh, Canada talking about how early accounts of them following our Native Americans around and, and essentially um, going in when after they made a bison kill and helping clean up. So they learned to associate people with food and would follow people around as they were moving around the landscape looking for bison. So, um, yeah, that's my last of my, my Y photos for me and, and hopefully all of us. Um, I painted a pretty dire picture early on in this talk. And now I want to kind of circle back and talk about what's being done. And a lot of efforts have gone on in, in places, uh, I would say, somewhat disorganized across the continent. Most recently, the Central Grasslands Roadmap was... Uh, an effort that came out of the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies based in Colorado to provide an overarching umbrella of support for grassland conservation, lobbying um, among a very diverse partnership. And you see here the Sovereign First Nations, US, Mexico, and Canada um, looking to make our conservation efforts a little more uh, concerted and coordinated across the biome because the threats we're dealing with are operating at scales that are beyond where most of our conservation work has been happening to date. And like I said, the NRCS has been very effective in, 
and selling that message of um, how to deal with eastern red cedar encroachment, juniper encroachment on our eastern and southern grasslands by uh, finding a common language to talk to our our landowner partners about the importance of grasslands and managing through fire and getting rid of trees and the importance to grass. Uh, we just had a summit in, in Fort Collins uh, last spring and we're moving ahead with uh, trying to operationalize this roadmap and the website is there if you want to check it out. I'm always available to answer questions about the roadmap and any of this grassland conservation stuff I talked about. So that, that's one big effort I've been involved with. It's very hopeful with a partnership that we're pulling together to try and coordinate these conservation efforts. And then these are just a list of things that um, come out of some of the bird work that I'm doing. These are more just generally directed towards uh, things you can do to help birds. But in some ways, some of these are very um, grassland bird centric, but most of them are pretty general. Um, Collisions is always a big thing and grassland birds are, are no exception. They just don't generally have the opportunity to run into too many windows. Um, gats, rodenticides, reducing lawns, planting natives, all these sort of good stuff. Bird friendly coffee, I can recommend. I drink it myself. It's very good coffee. Um, the other last one here is watching birds collect data in eBird. And I would say that the same is probably true from our, our plant side or insect side, that the more we know about our grasslands, the more effective we can be in telling the story about our grasslands and the impacts and things that we care about. With that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Beth, I think I'm just going to stop sharing the screen so I can see everybody better here. Sure, sure, great. Yeah, gosh, John, thank you so much. That was wonderful. All your thoughtful information as well as your uh, beautiful images there. My goodness. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll let people please go ahead and type any questions into the chat. There's a few in there. Um, and I'll start out with one that, um, like you, I really love the prairies and I've spent a lot of time out there, but I do know it can be hard to visit the prairies and experience, have the experiences that we see in your images. So do you have any tips for people that would like to go out in Montana and maybe spend more time on the prairies? What do you recommend? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend not going now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're especially hard to visit right now and not all that interesting. Most of the interesting stuff is underground this time of year. Um, like I said, May and June are, are really the, the times when I love to be in the prairie. Um, and as I mentioned, it's predominantly a private landscape. But like uh, Valley County in particular has a lot of public land if really uh, beautiful prairie in, in Northern Valley County. Um, Medicine Lake National Wildlife Refuge also has some very um, extensive prairie with a lot of the, the wildlife animals that I talked about here. Um, and then further south, there's a few refuges, uh, Valentine National Wildlife Refuge in Nebraska. Uh, there's uh, Kansas, the Flint Hills are also pretty um, important. Driving through to Nebraska Sandhills. Um, it, it's always tough though, because a lot of those are predominantly private. And so a lot of the viewing is from any sort of publicly accessible place. But um, Valentine National Wildlife Refuge, I think, would be one that would be uh, pretty special in the, the sand hills there. So any place you can find BLM land, I, I, I think is even in my mind is better because a lot of times you, you can be there by yourself. I find that refuges tend to concentrate people because that's that's where we think about going to visit a lot of these places to look for wildlife. But one of the things I find really special is being alone on the prairie and experiencing that uh, with either a small group or by myself is pretty special. And, and the BLM lands in eastern Montana can often do that in spades. Great. Yeah. Good. Good info there. Um, and we did have, um, Deb was asking, John, if you knew where you could buy native shortgrass prairie seed, and a lot of people did chime in and help yeah. her, and we had some mention of our um, our 
plant source guide that's on our website that has yeah. places in Montana. And I don't know if you had anything to add as far as date of plant seed sources. I don't, uh, other than uh, most of my work has been in sort of large scale restoration, uh, working with private landowners. We've got a landowner group in North Central Montana um, that is converting cropland back into grasslands. Uh, which is really fun to see. That's, that's nice to see new grasslands coming in rather than grasslands disappearing. And that's been a challenge for us is where to get enough native seed to do that effectively and particularly stuff that is more locally grown that has a better chance of succeeding. So uh, hopefully it's a good problem to have and it means we're doing grassland restoration, but it would be really nice to um, figure out a little bit better sources for locally grown seeds. And we've been working with uh, the Fort Belknap tribe a bit to see if that's something that could potentially be a, a business opportunity for our Native American partners in grassland conservation to take on. All right, yeah. And Sue is wondering what your thoughts are about American Prairie. Oh boy, that's a complicated one. Because I think, well, let me back up. I think it's pretty fascinating that that particular part of the world, we have a couple of very different conservation models happening. We've got TNC, who's been working in that landscape for a long time, um, bought a ranch, much like APR did, or like what is American Prairie, you know, um, early on but then realized that the management of that land was beyond what they were willing to um, invest in, couldn't invest and didn't have the money coming in to do that. And I'm paraphrasing, I suspect that the real, the story is much deeper than this, but I'll just leave it at that. And so Brian Martin has been instrumental in a lot of the conservation work in Eastern Montana, had uh, dreamed up this idea of using the, the ranch as a grass bank and providing the grass grown on their ranch to adjacent landowners um, with some stipulations. And that biggest stipulation was if you turn in over any of your existing grasslands, you're no longer participating in the grass bank, you're done and gone forever. Um, so that disincentivized conversion of native grasslands. But the way they incentivized grassland conservation on private land was by giving discounts to people who grazed on the Matador Ranch for the values that they had on their property. So the more sage grouse nights you had, the more grassland birds were documented on your lands, um, the more pronghorn you had. I don't know what all the measures were. You got a reduced rate in grazing on grass on the Matador Ranch. And so it incentivized that across the landscape in a very community developing way. APR, AP, took a very different approach and that to effectively, and, and I think they're right in this, to be certain in your management, um, it's probably best to own the land. And so they've took a very different approach of trying to uh, buy whatever lands were available to them in that landscape and manage it for the values that they wanted. So I think the jury's out. I think in some ways they're both very effective. Um, and I'm not sure of the costs, what, what the trade-offs are in each one of those models. Um, so I, I'm walking a fine line here. I, I, I see the value. I love seeing the bison out there. Um, but I worry about the, the impacts of the community. I love the way TNC has done that in that collaborative community. But certainly the, the certainty of that long-term maintenance of that model is dependent upon the willingness of landowners to want to participate. So I can see both ways and, and they're both doing great work in prairie conservation in that part of the world. Great, yeah. All right, Shirley is wondering if you have any recommendations for small acreage farmers in Montana trying to retain some grasslands on her farm, she's thinking of, and resources for help. Um, 
NRCS is, is kind of my go-to partner for private landowners and, and any of the programs they may have to help assist with financially with anything you can want to do on your private land. And in a lot of ways, I, I, I learned lessons from Brian Martin again on, from a private landowner standpoint, it's got to work for you, right? Um, and a lot of our NRCS folks understand the Farm Bill programs and what might work for you to do what, what you want to do on your lands. Um, so I, I, you know, it's a very personal question, I think, from a, from a landowner standpoint of how do you want to manage your lands? But I think there are opportunities for us in the private landowner realm of farming community to make tilled lands less impactful to remaining grasslands in regenerative farming, in cover crop practices that don't result in a, a completely foreign habitat type for a lot of the things that we're concerned about and are complementary to remaining native grasslands. So I think my, my general answer to that would be the more you can manage your croplands to be less impactful to your existing grasslands, I think the better off you're gonna be. Nice. Well, we're getting a lot of great comments in the chat. People are are very I, grateful and thanking. Can I? I noticed Joyce sent me a note, and I just want to say. Um, oh yeah, one of your I, irrelevant jobs. It <laughs> is. It was Joyce. It, it, it Joyce, was relevant for both of you guys. Isn't yeah. That nice? she, she kept me employed as I would venture off into different parts of the world, and I come back, and Joyce would find a job for. And she kept, it was a safe place for me to go when I was in Bozeman. Um, that really kind of got me through a lot of hard times. So I'm glad you said hi, Joyce. I, you don't know how impactful that was for me in my life to have you help me. Nice. Ken would like a little bit of information about how are independent ranchers coming on to grassland conservation in general, engaging with that? Um, I think it get, gets back to, well, this is a, one of the challenges of working in a private lands landscape is that everybody's different, right? Um, but the commonality for most ranchers is that their, their commodity is grass. If you don't have grass, you can't grow a lot of beef. And that's the primary use of most of our private lands, grazing lands that are still in grass. So when we start talking about grass in a, in, a, in a language that resonates with private landowners because that's their income, we fo start finding common values in, in grassland conservation. And that has been the key that I've seen in a lot of places where, where we can start linking up the things that each of us care about and finding that common ground. Uh, another example of, I mentioned that pounds of grass translation for landowners really resonated. The loss of pounds of grass that we could demonstrate by red cedar encroachment was unbelievable to them. It was like, oh, yeah, I remember now dad said that field used to be in grass and now it's all trees. And that's what it means is I've lost three tons of grass on an annual basis because I didn't do anything about those trees. That really speaks loudly. So that's where we're starting to see this, this folks getting together to deal with these threats that if your neighbor treats doesn't treat trees and you do, you're going to still have a problem with trees. And so is your neighbor. And so we're starting to see groups of people get together to deal with the threat at scales that matter to dealing with it. Another example I've seen is um, we start talking about groundwater recharge in our Playa Lakes in the southern grasslands of Colorado and New Mexico and, and uh, Nebraska, that those shallow wetlands were getting tilled up, converted, and all of a sudden people's wells started running dry, including municipal wells. And we were able to demonstrate that those, those wetlands played an important war part in that groundwater recharge. And if they would restore some of those wetlands, those well, their wells would actually respond and become active again. So we're starting, 
So we're seeing places where we can start finding that common language to talk about what conservation means to us individually. It's that why question again that I'm kind of hammered through my talk, right? Because it matters to us in ways that we probably don't even realize until it's kind of presented to us. Yeah, another example being carbon storage. We, we ah. didn't realize how much our grasslands, so these, these ranchers that are raising yes. their cattle, they're also storing carbon for yes. all of us, for the whole earth. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because that, remember early on in my talk, I talked about the ecology of grasslands and that all of that, the grasses and the root system underground. And we actually had an instance here recently trying to find some funding for grasslands and we had uh, uh, climate change scientists telling us that we should be planting trees and that any burning of grasslands they weren't going to allow because it was detrimental to, to carbon storage uh, climate change uh, concerns. And we were able to point out that your, your trees store carbon above ground and it's very susceptible to get when it, when it burns all of that carbon gets released. When grasses burn, very little carbon gets released. It's just that above ground part. All of the carbon or the majority of the carbon is stored underground where it's less volatile. And so restoration of former croplands could be a, a very good way to gain money from lands that were former croplands through a carbon storage. Um, you actually increase the storage in the soil by converting them into, back into grasslands. And there's a developing market for carbon that way. Great. All right. Well, you're getting a lot more thank yous uh, in the chat there. I think um, we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. John, it's always nice to spend time with you. And we, we really thank you for your time. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, and, and take care. Thanks, Beth.